our main presenter is Alex, who was just talking. I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself and your project. Um, and he'll present for an hour or so, or maybe a little bit less. And then in the second half, we also have with us today, I see Carol Ann O'Hagan. Hi, CA. And I think probably Ivana is the, yeah, hi, I see your face now. This says Parody Technologies. Um, so these two are Parody's events team, and they've been generous enough to offer help making seminar sort of a bigger um, or better attended and, and more useful event. And so in the second half, we're going to basically like share some ideas that we've had and get everybody's feedback and opinions on, you know, what, what we can, what direction you'd like to see seminar go in. Um, and then I guess like before we started, I see we have some new folks today, which is awesome. I love it when that happens. And so I just wanted to say, you know, welcome to seminar. Um, this is usually like a pretty casual call. So the idea is many or most of us here are developing on substrate or with substrate and you know, in the course of a day or a week working on Substrate, you learn a ton. And so this is an opportunity to, to kind of learn from each other. Today, particularly, we're going to mostly be learning from Alex. Um, but at any point, it's fine to like interrupt with a question or just to share like, oh, Alex, the thing you just said is like also relevant to my project or, or anything like that. And then I guess maybe just before we um, have him uh, get started. I wanted to see if any of the, the new people wanted to say hello or, or introduce themselves. So uh, yeah, feel free to unmute your mic and just say hello. Hello. I'm not new, but I love saying hello. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Dan. Good to see you. Hi, Spencer. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, hey, guys and girls. I've got retainers in my mouth, so it might be a little hard to understand here. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm Spencer, I'm a geologist, and I've been uh, trying to build a substrate chain for the past like three weeks, and uh, finally woke up early enough to watch seminar. So thanks for doing this. Awesome, glad to have you here. Thanks for getting up so early. <laughs> where where are you that. at? Uh, I'm in Oakland right now, but uh, for the next few months I'll be in Montana, so I'll get that extra hour. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, cool. Good, glad to have you here. Thanks. Um, also welcome Addy, good to see you at seminar. Um, hey, from, okay. from us as well, from the events team uh, of Parity, but we'll talk a little bit later. Yeah, cool. Nice to see you here, Ivana, thanks for coming. Glad I'm here. Okay, cool, so so Alex um, Alex is from SubSocial, a social network that's building on Substrate. And um, Alex, if you wanna get started, I'll let you you know introduce yourself and your project and you know, I'm a little familiar with the, the jargon in subsocial because I've seen it a few times. But if you want to just introduce like what, you know, spaces are and some of the other uh, vocab you've chosen and then, yeah, we'll go wherever you want to. Thanks for presenting today. Okay, thanks for having me. Also, there is Vlad from my team as well. I see his in participants. So not only me. Yeah, I'm here. Um, Hi again, Vlad. Nice to see you. Yeah, me too. Okay, so um, Subsocial is a set of uh, substrate modules or pilots that uh, allows you to create your decentralized uh, uh, social network. So uh, we, fig uh, we looked at um, lots of uh, major social networks and tried to figure out what is a common functionality among of them. And uh, as you can imagine, it includes uh, creating um, blog and writing posts into the blogs. Then it should be possible to write comments and below the posts and then upload. And sometimes uh, it's possible to download a post and a comment. And then if you're interested in blogging, you should be able to follow it and then receive notifications and see your feed on the blogs you follow. So this is basically um, the major functionality that is super common across different social networks, even independently of uh, the name of the blog. For example, in some systems, they call it a page, or um, it could be a channel, it could be a space, if it's uh, talking about groups, where not only um, owner can communicate, but uh, different people can communicate. For example, on uh, Quora, they call it spaces, and uh, at some other places I saw this name used. Um, for example, in, uh, on Facebook, they call it groups. And on Telegram, there's also two uh, sim quite similar uh, terms. Uh, one is chat, another is uh, channel, and the third one is uh, group. And actually, 
among all of them are some similarities like there is a piece of information so-called post or message or sometimes they call it story where you want to share something like text uh, image or video with uh, your followers or other participants uh, but the difference is that uh, in channel there is only one person that publishes something and others just follow it and read uh, the published information and uh, in groups uh, um, other participants can publish uh, information so this is not actually the huge difference uh, from some point of view and we decided to create a more flexible system that allows to reuse the same structure for uh, several purposes like uh, either you want to create a personal blog or you want to create a channel or you want to create a group etc so we come up with a, a thing called space and space it's sort of like uh, you have a space in a chain like there is a, a chain whole chain and uh, inside of this chain you create the space for your activities for your information and this space uh, identifies you it it, it uh, plays the role of a profile at some point for your account so any account can have uh, multiple spaces and even if you use for example multi multi sig functionality from uh, substrate palettes then uh, essentially you could uh, have space that has multi ownership so this is the idea of space so by space you can think of it like either channel or group it depends on uh, these settings that uh, either allow other people to write into the space so this is a group or if only owners this is a channel and uh, by this uh, we came closer to uh, the topic of this uh, seminar it's uh, roles and palettes and at some point we just figure out that um, designing proper permissions and roles uh, we can we could get this um, functionality for spaces to, to be able to make it as a private blog or group or channel so I started to look at different uh, permissions and role systems in, in other uh, products and like for example on telegram or I don't know on file system or in other messengers and uh, I liked this approach um, taken by discord Vlad also suggested me to take a look at Discord permissions and roles. So we took a look on this and uh, actually our design was a little bit inspired by, by this, but with the specifics to what we have. So um, maybe I, I could start to share, share the code. Let's see. That sounds good. Hey, Alex, I have a question too about the, the spaces. So, well, mostly I just want to make sure I understood correctly so far. So the spaces is like a generic uh, or like abstract term where someone can just post content in the social media platform. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So I just uh, navig navig navigated to space. So here it is, our space structure. Oops. One second. Yeah. So you can see that uh, space has an identificator and they have some utility fields like created, updated, to see who created and when updated, if. Uh, and then uh, there is an owner that could be a multi-sig. Um, and then handle, unique handle, uh, that will, should be used on in uh, browsers and in mobile apps to identify this. It's sort of like username or handle on Twitter on, or on messengers, the same. And this is a pointer to off-chain information about the space. And we have some statistics over here, like number of posts and followers. And also we have uh, score and permissions. So this thing is uh, relatively new here. A container for posts. So you can post into, into the space. And uh, depending on space permissions, we have default space permissions per the chain and uh, space permissions per space and it's optional for you as an owner to override it and uh, by this uh, we can allow only owner or others to post to this space to this container okay 
maybe yeah. you have another question to clarify before I go. Uh, sure, yeah, sure, I'll, I'd be happy to. So I, I think that makes sense. So like, let's say you've created some space here uh, on, on subsocial, so you would be the owner, I guess. And then like, if your goal is to have this be like a shared blog for like you and Tomash or something, then you as the owner would like update this permissions thing to give Tomash permission to post into this space. Is that like generally the idea? Yes, so um, there are several ways to go, I guess. Uh, we haven't tested it yet deeply with uh, multi-ownership uh, using Pilot, but uh, I believe it should be possible to have to be um, equal or almost like equal uh, multi owners using substrate utils with multi multi seek, and I guess it should be possible. Or if it's not yet, uh, we can make some tweaks at here. Uh, so the first approach is yeah. So you, you're making others uh, equivalent co owners, and you specify a threshold on multi seek and everything. So if you want to change something. Uh, so these owners have the permission. But more a flexible thing is to specify who else can post here. And then there are a couple of ways to do this. So for example, we have a space permission. This is the num where we specify all the possible actions that could happen on the system. And for example, what we have, a manage roles, it means that uh, a uh, person has that account that has this permission uh, can create, update, delete roles. Then uh, I will skip this one uh, just for simplicity. Uh, then you have permission to update space or block users. This one is not implemented yet. Some of them are just tabs for future. And then uh, you can have, um, I should be able to create subspaces or update. This is also tabs for future functionality, but uh, these things we already use this and this. So it allows to let others to create posts and we have granular setting to all of them update own posts or you want to allow somebody to update any posts. For example, you are creating online magazine or publication and you want to have uh, editors that uh, should be able to edit posts. Then you would like to specify this uh, update any posts uh, permission for this uh, specific list of accounts and they will be able to edit posts, make some corrections or something else. Then uh, we have setting to delete own posts. And for example, why we could uh, want to have this or maybe we don't want to, to have this. So for example, on Twitter, uh, you are able to delete posts, tweets, but you're not able even to update your own posts. And uh, if you want to create a Twitter on using subsocial palettes, it will specify that, for example, everybody can create posts, everybody can delete own posts, but uh, you will not use update own posts, update any posts at all. So you will, you will not use these permissions. And then you will have Twitter. But if you want to have medium with uh, editors, you will specify that uh, everybody uh, can create posts, update own posts, delete own posts. But uh, some of them, like uh, uh, co-writers or editors of the publication, should be able to update uh, any post, for example. What, what do you think on this? Is it uh, clear enough or not? not? I think for, for me, the concept makes sense. I, for a while, I used this content management system called Drupal that had uh, pretty similar permissions. So that part seems familiar. What, one question I have, and you can either answer it now or like whenever you think it makes more sense to answer it, is like, if you're using this permission update any posts, like obviously it makes sense in some situations, like you said, like the editor of the magazine, or, you know, if this is like a social media for some particular organization and they want to have some like reasonable censorship, you might give like a moderator update any <laughs> post or whatever. But what I'm not sure about is like, uh, yet is how do you assign these permissions to like specific, um, I guess, accounts in this case, like, you know, I might want my editor to ed edit any post, but I might not just want like some rando to be able to edit. Uh -huh, yes, yes, very good, very good yeah. one. <laughs> so I just didn't get to this point in my in my story. We just uh, looking at one per enum, just one enum. So I, here I just explain what we have and what could be used, could be uh, possible, and then I will explain how it could be used. So good question. Uh, we will get to this point for sure. Um, 
just let's uh, finish this uh, uh, permissions because it, it, it makes some sense to understand why we have something and why we don't have something. Um, for example, we don't have update any comments. We don't have this because um, from our, um, our vision and uh, how we see it, it, it doesn't make really sense to let anybody to edit comments. So comments is considered like a, a private property or something like this, like your own thing. So uh, you came to any place and you just uh, say your opinion on this. Uh, why should anybody be able to edit comments? So it didn't make sense. But for posts, I can imagine like uh, if you are creating a publication, magazine, anything, and you have editors. So it makes sense to let editors edit posts because maybe this post could be posted only by editors and writers, by this small um, team, like maybe five people or 10 people. But comments is something that uh, usually are available to a broader audience, like uh, hundreds, thousands, uh, millions of people. And uh, from this perspective, it didn't make a lot of sense to let edit any post. So we just included create comments, update, and or delete all own posts, own comments. But we included block comments. We will Im uh, implement this feature later. And block comments, uh, it doesn't mean that it will delete comments or edit comments. It just uh, will put comment to a block list. And then UI that respects these uh, settings will not show this comment because uh, owners or somebody else uh, are not happy seeing this comment under their blog or their post. But uh, still, comment owner, as a person who wrote it, uh, it owns this comment and he, 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 he can uh, get this comment to another blog or delete it or whatever. So this is the core idea behind this. And the last thing is uh, you can enable or disable uploads, downloads, and sharing of the post to the outer space, to the outer channel or group. Okay, so um, this is a space permission enum. And then uh, interesting thing is that we have uh, pre-built built-in roles uh, for the system. So uh, it's like on Discord, there is everyone and on Discord there is a owner, I guess. Yeah, there is built-in only for, uh, everyone, but on some systems there are there could be followers, there could be built-in role for members or owners, etc. And we come up, came up with uh, four built-in roles. First is no one. No one is sort of like the same as disable the feature. So if uh, no one has some permission, it means that uh, nobody can do this permission. And this permission is, I mean, this action is uh, disabled. So if you put, for example, uh, create comment in uh, no one, then you should not be able, not, I mean, nobody should be able to create comments under your posts. It's sort of like just a uh, comment enabled uh, false, so comment disabled. Then everyone is just like everyone, any, any account on the chain. Follower is an account that is following this space, like channel or group, and specific space owner. Space owner is the owner of this specific space. Um, and so we can specify permissions into a set, Bitrix set. We use for this Bitrix set. Here we have a uh, type alias for this. And in Bitrix set, it, Bitrix set, you specify unique uh, values of this enum that we just discussed, uh, reviewed here, this one. So by specifying uh, Bitrix set, you can say uh, what unique uh, per actions are allowed per any built-in role. And it's possible to say, for example, um, let's say, only followers and only space owner can uh, write comments. By this, you need just specify uh, create comments here and create comments here. Um, and another thing that is, uh, we, we are using this uh, structure. So this is the structure with built in for roles. We are using it for default space permissions per, uh, on the level of chain. So for any space that is created, if a space owner is not overriding space permissions, then default permissions of a space is used. It's like with Kusama, there are some constants and uh, they used uh, to set up the, how the chain works, I mean, block time and some rewards and everything. So we are, we are using the similar. 
for example, if we go to, where is it, in, in, uh, in runtime, let's see. Okay, permission. Yeah, so we have default, default space permissions. So this is, set, this is a set of uh, permissions per every role, per every built-in role that will be used uh, for any space that will be created and that is not overriding permissions. And we already put uh, for everyone that everyone can uh, update on space, subspaces and delete them, update and delete posts and create comments. So everyone is able to create comments and uh, unless it's override, overridden and update the lead comments as well and upload the node share. Then no one can do nothing. So uh, this means that uh, we don't uh, disable any actions. Then follower has nothing because uh, everyone has a lot of the things to do. So we don't override our followers here. And uh, space owner has uh, the rest of functionality like he can manage roles and uh, override post permissions and create subspaces and update space uh, and so on. And uh, space owner by default can block anything inside of this space, like subspaces, posts, comments, and users. And by users, we mean uh, accounts and other spaces. So this is uh, about space uh, permissions. So we include permissions as a module here, as a palette, uh, part of runtime. And also we have <coughs> have a social palette that was recently uh, refactored and roles. So then if you don't, if you have any questions, please ask about permissions because uh, I'm going to roles after this. I, I have a few, or I have one at least. Uh, up above, just slightly above you were showing us like those default permissions or the permissions you set up, I think. What was, was that part of like implementing one of the configuration traits for one of these palettes or where, where, what was the context for that code that said like, you know, yeah, this code. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. So it's uh, using parameter types for defining space permissions. So it's a uh, constant. So it's it one big be. constant that uh, is just has several sets. So it took several lines to write it up, I guess. Yes. Yes. And we, we just uh, specify for type uh, default space permissions and permissions. So, and then we pass this uh, constant inside of permissions module here. I see. Oh, this is kind of cool. So, so right now you're showing us like the subsocial runtime and before you were showing us the permissions palette. And what I just yes. now realized is like, if I think this is cool and I want to make a network that's similar, like that uses subsocial palettes, I could use your exact palette but maybe I don't like your decision about yes. like the space owner can block this or that. And so I just plug in a different set of default permissions, like, right. Mm -hmm. That's the code you're showing us here. Okay. I get it. Yeah, okay. correct. So first we just reviewed the permissions uh, palette over here. And then I just let uh, moved to runtime. So this is our exact runtime for our node. And we decided to go with sort of these permissions by default, we can change it later if we see any reason for this. But right now it's something like this, something like this. But even if you're running uh, a space inside of subsocial uh, chain, you, you should be able to override uh, our dis default decisions. So, and you should be able to override anything as you see it. So this is just default for, it's like protection uh, from the fools, right? So if, if, if somebody didn't implement on UI, great, user experience to say about this permission. So you just uh, forgot about this or any other case. So we just put something like uh, that makes common sense for most of the situations. <clears throat> so yeah, okay, we reviewed permissions. We reviewed how we create default permissions on the root level, I mean, on, on level of chain in runtime. And then we're ready to go to roles palette. So what is the role split? And, and this is exactly, exactly answers your question, uh, Josh, about uh, how to say that this exact account should be able to, let's say, edit posts. And maybe you want to allow to two or three accounts to do this, not to everybody. So this is uh, where we uh, need to look at roles. So what is roles? Roles is, uh, has a struct that is at some point similar to spaces. We have ID 
created, updated, and we have space ID. So every role should be uh, linked to a space where this role created and exists, and it could not be exist uh, outside of this space. It, it doesn't make sense. Uh, then we have uh, some helper things like disabled. If you want, don't want to delete role, but you just want to disable, maybe something went wrong. Or maybe you want to specify a temporary ro role that will, be, will live uh, until this block. Maybe you want to specify a role for one month. And then also we have APFS hash to store some information about this role, like name, description. Maybe you want to specify avatar for your role if you want to differentiate them on UI easier. Um, and also the major thing here is permissions. Permissions is a bit reset of permission announce. So permission, space permission set is a alias to bit reset of uh, space permission announce. And then um, let's look at uh, storage. So this is also interesting part. And the major thing is uh, first is uh, next role ID plus uh, role by ID. So by providing role ID, you get uh, the full information about this role. And then um, we want to assign a role to some users. Then uh, we need to modify this storage item where you specify role ID as a key of a map of the storage and vector of, uh, ac of accounts. User actually here is um, just helper structure, it's a num that can accept either account or space because in our uh, situation, space uh, should could be considered as a profile. So just don't, uh, yeah, don't think about this too much. Just uh, imagine that user is account in this case. So by role, you get list of uh, accounts that are allowed, uh, that assigned uh, to this role. And then by space, you receive vector of roles that were created inside of this space. And then also interesting storage item is, uh, if you want to receive all the roles that this users, user has inside of this space, then we have this uh, storage item. It co it's called uh, in space role IDs by user. So by providing uh, a tuple of uh, account ID and space ID, you receive a list of roles that this account has inside of this space. Okay, let's review what extrinsics we have. So major things is um, create role. So for most of the entities in uh, Subsocial, we have, we use a similar approach for naming. We have, we are following this uh, crude uh, approach where you have create, update, uh, delete, and so on. So we have create role, uh, we have update role. So update for existing roles inside of this space. Then we have delete role. It delete all the information associated with this role inside of this space. I mean, um, yeah, okay, we will go through this a little bit later. And then also interesting extrinsics, uh, grant role and revoke role. So by grant role, you assign this role to some list of users. And by revoke, you remove this role from the list of users. And so what is interesting about this uh, create role thing is that at some point when we check for some simple, simple uh, validations, like uh, no permissions provided or invalid APFS hash, at some point we also need to check that the current user has a right to manage the roles. And here we have this method, ensure role manager. It means that uh, this current user who sent transaction called who. So this account, right, origin, who, uh, he should be a role manager in this space. And this, we have a needed uh, loose coupling because um, we store space owner in, this, in the social palette. But uh, social palette should depend on roles to check uh, whether uh, current user can write posts, write comments, update space. So social palette should depend on roles. But at the same time, roles should depend on some information from social because role should be able to check is the current user a space owner. So if you don't implement it in a loose approach, 
then you will have a cyclic dependency between roles and social, social and roles. Here, so roles and social. And for this, I, I asked uh, Joshua a couple of times to <laughs> create a template to demonstrate how to create the Sloth Calvin. Yeah, in Substrate, there are a lot of uh, examples inside the Substrate itself, but uh, sometimes it's quite hard to navigate through all the code because a lot of code and uh, hard to uh, understand what is going on here. So recipe is a very good uh, source of uh, information to, to see, understand something in just uh, in, in, in one look. So yeah, we created this uh, loose coupling form between roles and socials via traits. And we have a package here called traits and it contains this uh, few traits that we needed to make connection from uh, roles to social and from social to roles. So for example, um, for example, for roles, we need to get a space with some small information, some, only a small piece of information like who is owner and the list of permissions if this, there is override of default permissions. So, because uh, space has much more information here and uh, owner and permission only one of them and space also requires to, to know about trade and we want, don't want to depend on this trait and so on. So we just specified uh, that account is a parameter and uh, we have just this utility structure space for all. So it has owner and uh, override of permissions inside of this space. And then we have this trait that uh, lets roles palette to get information about space, this minimum set that is needed just for roles from this social permission. Whereas this method, and another one method is um, to check storage inside of social with a current account that is trying to do something inside of roles, like this account, who, uh, whether it's follower or not, because in default permissions, it could be allowed that follower can manage role for, uh, roles, for example. So we also need to check this information. But for spaces, uh, we also need to get information from roles. And this uh, means that we need to, sh uh, to check that, ensure that the current user or account uh, has this exact space permission in space. But we need to check this in two places. First, in default space permissions on the chain level that I showed you in uh, runtime. And another place we need to check through space overrides. And the third place where we check uh, for permissions is uh, in dynamic roles. So for this reason, we need to uh, call access to storage of roles from roles in uh, social. That's why we'll create this another trait, permission checker. Okay. And permission checker accepts a couple of uh, parameters. Uh, account, uh, who should be checked for permission, then space permission context. Um, it contains such information like uh, space owner, is follower, and uh, space permissions and then exact permissions that we're checking. And if uh, account doesn't have permission, which we should throw this uh, error. And for example, let's, uh, let's see how we, how we call this from, uh, from spaces. So in spaces, we have this uh, utility functions. Yeah, so we implement this uh, trade from, um, utility traits, uh, permission checker in, oh no, it's not here, um, it's here. Yeah, permission checker is implemented in roles and in roles is just called uh, its internal method that it called uh, ensure user has space, space permission. And in this method, is implemented over here. So in this method, we just uh, check uh, whether the current user is owner. So we define their role, uh, or maybe it's follower. And then if, uh, if it's uh, owner and the owner is allowed to manage roles and we return, if it's follower, it's follower is uh, allowed to manage roles, we also return successfully. 
And if it didn't found that uh, in default permission, so in space overrides, uh, current user has permission to do this action, we just go through dynamic list of roles. We know that social networks are quite content heavy and, uh, and, and building any type of product in a decentralized manner, you always have to kind of make decision of what do you put on a chain and what do you store off chain. So just wanted to know what is your, your thinking about that? Do you have any rule of thumb or, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's also the question, who is the owner of the data? And I, I guess that there is no one owner, but when I see the source code, I think that the owner is, the whole owner of the data is substrate, right? Mm. <laughs> It, de it depends uh, how, how code implemented inside of Substrate. Is if, if code has bugs, then maybe everybody is owner. But if code implemented without bugs or uh, less, uh, as less possible bugs inside, then in our case, uh, the person, account who created space or post or comment is an owner. And uh, if uh, on the level of space, there is no override that um, somebody else can edit your comments or something else, then uh, yeah, you are, you are the owner. And about uh, content heavy things, uh, so the answer is that um, in Substrate we store only relations and permissions. So who created what, when, who owns what, who, want, who can be able to edit something. But uh, the content itself we store in IPFS cluster. Uh, we have another sub-project that is called of chain storage and there we um, link all this information. So we store uh, content in APFS and then off-chain just uh, tells to UI what is the APFS seed of that content. And only after content is stored to APFS, we put it into a transaction and uh, save in substrate storage. And then on UI, when we load in posts, uh, we look in substrate we get uh, post information, who is owner, when created, uh, what space it belongs to, and what is APFS seed. And then by APFS seed, we load the uh, content itself and show on UI. I hope it answers the question. Yep, makes sense. Thanks. And for me, to be honest, rather no. You said that the, the, the owner of the data is, the owner of the data is the owner but my question is where the data are stored and what is the assumption? Because you have said it depends how the solution is implemented. So what assumptions do you have? What is your goal of the subsocial where the data is, are gonna to be stored? So data is stored uh, in APFS cluster and uh, we're going to run uh, this uh, initial APFS nodes that are connected into a cluster, uh, but uh, indeed uh, anybody can run their own APFS nodes. And for example, uh, maybe you want to upload videos. So you can run your APFS node and store uh, the video and then get the APFS seed and put into transaction and it will be written in, for example, subsocial or somebody else uh, who is running subsocial pullets. But uh, maybe it could not be supported by the exact UI. I mean, there could be endless number of UIs, of uh, variations, of uh, customizations. And uh, if UI supports uh, your node, if uh, it uh, recognizes it, then uh, your content will be loaded. Maybe you want to create your own uh, UI as it uh, reads from your own APFS nodes, and it should be possible as well. We want to work on this functionality that will allow you to create sort of a portal where only a subset of uh, spaces will be uh, showed on end UI. So in this way, you, you will be able to create sort of sub-networks within sub-social network or any other chain. So basically, you can run any APFS node and connect to um, blockchain but we want to start with some uh, ipfs nodes that we will run and they will be connected linked into ipfs cluster 
and then cluster every node replicates another node and a community can also connect to our cluster and replicate the state so sort of create backups so this is an answer to this question so alex i think that's kind of an interesting like it sort of that that kind of communicates something fundamental about these sort of social networks in my opinion so like you showed us through your various roles earlier or i mean uh, permissions and there's you know like edit such and such or delete such and such and all all that kind of stuff um and i'm just thinking about like a lot of the social networks today like if we just take facebook for example they have these these features that basically work from a ux perspective where in the feature is like who can read this post and i can check a box you know like these specific people can read it or like all my followers can read it or it can be like totally public or whatever and the implementation of those features depends on oh you're muted wait wait you're muted oh wow i can't believe mm -hmm. i was muted How, was yeah I muted you started to say implementation of these features depends Oh, I just, I must've just bumped it. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. Thanks. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, like, so it, let's say I check the box that says only my friends can read that. And if I want that to actually work, it depends completely on my trust in Facebook. Cause what really happens is I tell Facebook the data. And then when someone says like, Hey, let me read this Facebook checks, like, okay, is this guy a follower? Is he supposed to see it? And then either gives it or not. But like, you know, at any point, Facebook could could change that. He, they could be like, we're not going to respect the user's wishes anymore, mm -hmm. or we're going to give in to the pressure of the government who's asking to read this, or whatever it is. And I think your design here makes that really explicit because the content itself, like when I post something on Subsocial, it's very clear there's there's no box about who can read this, and the data goes to IPFS. And I think that's like kind of an an interesting design decision because it helps users understand the semantics of like what's really happening with their data and where they're, where they're really sending it. So yeah, I just thought that was a cool observation. Yeah. For example, um, right now, if you are going with, uh, let's say with subsocial and, uh, our APFS nodes, then by default, uh, <clears throat> everything is, um, public. So currently it's not possible to write, uh, private or to some group of uh, people, but if you run your IPFS node and you publish, uh, to your IPFS nodes only and uh, you allow your friends to connect to them, then you can use subsocial just to, as a store of uh, relations that you own this and uh, this thing has this IPFS seed. And then if you share uh, UI or, or IPFS node access with your friends and only your friends will see it. So this is a direction where it could go and to, uh, to be evolved in this direction. And also another feature could be like, uh, encryption maybe you want to encrypt to, to all your followers uh, using a uh, super uh, secret secret key that is shared among your followers so maybe you want to go with substrate t right so you want to let uh, some server with specific processor uh, to decode to your fo for your followers the content so maybe you, you post encrypted content and uh, that processor knows uh, the secret and it encodes to the group of people that are paid subscribers to your blog or group or anything else. So it, what, what I'm trying to say is that uh, it doesn't mean that we implemented everything, uh, but we try to implement it in, in flexible way and uh, to put some deep thinking into the base, basic layer of this. And sometimes it takes some more time that we wanted to implement something because we want this flexibility that would allow to add more features on top of this. I think we are running out of time, yes? It's like 53 minutes. Uh, yeah, if you wanted to take like 10 more minutes or so, that would be fine probably. Yeah, um, so let's just see uh, where we call this uh, check permission thing from the social uh, palette. So let's go to where is it? here. Ensure account. Yeah. So, for example, in this uh, version of the source code, we have seven calls um, to that implementation of uh, roles trait in inside of a social palette. And in this case, as we what we are checking. So for example, in uh, update space, we check 
information about that current user uh, has uh, update space permission. And if not, we throw this error, no, permi no permission to update space. So in other place, similar. So if it's uh, create post extrinsic, you can see it here. Then uh, if it's a regular post, a shared post, we check that person has right to create the post. And if it's comment, we check that uh, account has right to create comment and throws different errors, no permission to create post and to create comments. And in other places where we check permissions is, oh, oops, let's create post again. Uh, oh yeah, it's a share post. So here um, we check that the uh, account has permission to share the post. And another place, another two places. Um, what is here? It's a update post extrinsic. And here we just check that this person has permission to, um, yeah, above we ch just check uh, what kind of permission we need to check. So for example, if it's a comment, we check that a person has right to update comment. If it's post, uh, has right to update own post if it's owner, or if it's not owner, that uh, the person has right to update any post. And then we just specify this permission to check permission checker and it checks uh, has permission or not. If no, throw error. And yeah. So also in, in other places, we check for opposed and votes here. For example, you, you want to design social networks that, or, or you just want to create a, a space that doesn't have upvotes. Then we need to check permissions that people uh, has permission to for downloads. And if nobody has permission for downloads, then error, easy. So this is how we use uh, roles inside of uh, social. And the last thing I'm going to show is, uh, we earlier mentioned that inside of roles, we need to check uh, that current user is uh, owner, for example, and has permission to manage roles. So for this, we have this call that is called the Ensure Role Manager. In, in every extrinsic on roles palette, uh, we check this uh, uh, Ensure function. So like when creating a role, um, when, uh, okay, let's see. When update role here, and when deleting role, and grant, and revoke, yeah. And this thing is implemented here in functions. So we just uh, ensure that the user has space permission and we load in space from space storage and check that uh, account has uh, managed role permissions. That's it. I, I think we could go in, in, in more details, but uh, time is uh, out. I want to I want to ask just a, like one more question at least I, I remember pretty early on in this presentation you showed us uh, this struct that had where there were like four sort of hard coded default roles like there was everyone mm -hmm. and none I forget what the other two were but they they made sense yeah, yeah. this looks right yeah oh yeah exactly that's the one mm -hmm. so where so then the roles pass so these four are always there as like not optional and then the roles palette i think uh, that also allows you to like define your own roles that you can sort of like add in here right yes. mm -hmm. so, so where... built-in roles and set are dynamic roles yeah so where yeah oh yeah that's good way to call it so where are the dynamic roles sort of like wired in to this permissions palette and is it possible to say like i don't want dynamic roles i'm fine with these four like don't worry about um, the dynamic roles yeah okay dynamic roles uh stored in, in roles palette. And this is the storage that we went through at the early on today. So this is where we store dynamic roles here inside of this uh, storage items. Role by ID, users by role ID, and role IDs by space, and role IDs by user in the space. So uh, thanks to these storage items, uh, we can have dynamic roles. And uh, we check for permissions into the method that is called um, here. 
uh, has permission in space roles. So we get user account space ID and permission we want to check. And then uh, we get role IDs by this user in this space. And then we uh, loop through all these role IDs, load role details and check if it's not disabled, if it's not expired. And then if role permissions contain this exact permission. So for this user in this space, we found some role by looping through these roles. And if in this role there is a permission that we are interested in, then we are cool, we're returning okay. Otherwise we're returning error that was provided when calling the function check this permission for this guy. So this is a yeah, dynamic this part. I guess yeah, I, I, I feel like here I we combine them. Here we combine. So here is a top level function that ensure user has space permission. So first, uh, we, uh, we check that uh, user has space. Mm. Yeah, here. So we check uh, the role of the user, like built-in roles. This is as a check for built-in roles. Is it owner? Is it follower? And then uh, we check that user has this permission. So we specify context, this built-in roles, owner, follower, and space permission overrides. And then uh, we check dynamic roles. Yeah. yeah. So this part all makes, makes a lot of sense and seems like a nice design. I, I think the piece that I feel like I'm missing, and probably you said it, and I, it, I might have missed it. Okay. So like there's somewhere in your chain, there's got to be an extrinsic that's like create new post or something where I like actually type my blog and, and everything. And so like when I call that extrinsic, I'm sure it has to check like, okay, does Joshi have permission to post in this space? Um, and so like, I guess the question I'm asking is how does that code, the code from like create post or whatever it's called, how does it interface with this roles palette? I, it must be through one of those traits you showed earlier, but I just wondered if we could see that. Yes, part. yes, exactly. Um, maybe it's, uh, yeah, for sure, it's hard to grasp all this information in, 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 one, in one goal. So again, um, we have this traits uh, package over here. There is social, there is traits, there is roles, permissions. And here we have this uh, traits, it's called permission checker. So this, is, uh, this trait is common across uh, roles palette and social palette. And if you look where it's used, permission checker, it's used in roles and in social. And in roles, we have this uh, file functions. Uh, we implement this trait over here. So we implement permission checker. And it, this is exact implementation of this uh, checking uh, built default permissions, override permissions, and uh, built-in dynamic roles here. So it's called uh, its internal method of roles. And then in social, we import this trait and then we require, where is it? Uh, this is a roles type. And then we at runtime specify the implementation of this permission checker. And then we specify that roles palette implements permission checker for social. This is the part I was thinking of that I hadn't seen. So like that line that you have highlighted 219, I think that's a super cool line. So this is where you're telling um, there, if I'm, if I'm right, this is where you're saying like whatever file this is, we're in here. It needs some notion of a permission checker. Like, you know, this palette doesn't care how you've implemented the permission checker. It just needs yes. some permission checker that satisfies that trait. And then like the roles palette that you walked us through is one particular implementation and like a, a good one. And that that's the mm -hmm. one that you're here, I guess. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank yeah, you. Exactly. So uh, when we check for permissions, we um, refer to this roles. And for example, um, I implemented this helper function here, ensure account has permission. This is uh, implement implementation for uh, social, uh, and this is used in uh, create post, up upvote, and don't want, and everything. And then we refer to this T roles and call this ensure account permission that is implemented in roles in our case. Um, like here, where is it? 
Okay, somewhere, somewhere there, it's somewhere there. And then uh, in runtime, let's say um, social. social. Okay, so this is a trade for social and we provide all this in implementations and uh, this is a role. So we specify that roles palette implements roles. And from roles, we just need uh, only one fun function to be implemented and it's called ensure user has space permissions that's it yeah great that that's really cool that's a it's a, this is like a really nice demo of using the loose palette coupling in practice i i wish chris de costa was here today because i yeah, i know he was asking about that for his his live accounting chain too but there's just more examples of it everywhere now mm, okay and uh, last last um, thing to, to notice is that uh, social and roles palette, they both uh, tightly depend on uh, permissions palette because we need to know all this uh, enum uh, of permission in spaces and in roles. So we use uh, loose coupling and tight coupling. That's it. Awesome, thanks Alex. So maybe just to give you an opportunity to sort of like sh show your project a little bit since you taught us so much. You, I know you shared some links in um, Riot earlier about like the live UI for people to play with subsocial, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So currently I can show you alpha version and we're going to launch beta net uh, this summer in the beginning, I guess. And so, so, so what we have here, let's see. So we have um, Polkadot extension, is, it's connected to our UI. And via Polkadot extension, um, we inject the accounts that is allowed to um, do any actions on, uh, on the chain if they have uh, our tokens. And for example, in this case, we are uh, acting as a Alice. And as I said, we can have um, notifications here. It's loaded uh, from uh, Postgres database because in Postgres we built uh, notifications per account. Um, we also can implement this in off-chain work, for example, but uh, didn't get some enough time to implement this. And we can have subscriptions, the blogs or spaces you're following. Um, <clears throat> so this is our three blocks that Alice is following. And for example, if you go to this uh, space, you can see this, it, it has custom menu, like avatar, name, and button to follow and follow, and custom menu per this space. It's uh, possible to create a custom menu. So if you are an owner of this space, you can go to edit form and create um, different uh, menu items, like th th that is pointing to outer URL, for example, or that is pointing to some content by uh, tags, like on Medium, you can change order of this. Um, for space menu, yeah. So, of course, you can you can see a post over here, and this is uh, one of the posts posted by this account, and it has uh, three reactions. You can click on it and see who who voted, who downvoted. Maybe you want to punish these guys for downvoting <laughs> <laughs> uh, after you. And then you can see a text. Uh, currently implemented text as uh, information in APFS, but there is some. A good idea is to implement uh, tags in term chain and to use uh, reputation per this text, like on Stack Overflow. Maybe it will make some impact on logic or some decision inside of space. And then you can have comments. And again, you can upload and vote post. You can upload and vote comment. For example, we don't like this comment. Let's send it. Okay. Yeah, and the thing is that uh, currently it showed you a um, confirmation model from Polka.ui, but uh, we're going to work on session keys. And that thing should, uh, uh, should not ask you about uh, confirmation every time. So it will create a sort of proxy session key for your account. It, it will allow you to sign a transaction implicitly, not asking for confirmation. So this is a decision about uh, UX. Yeah. And we support Markdown. so. You can uh, insert any images, uh, use uh, text formatting for post, for comment, like, like here, right? 
And so this text is going, you, when you submit that comment, that calls create <laughs> post and that text is going to IPFS and some metadata gets updated on chain, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can comment even from preview of the post over here and not need to go to the post itself. So if you, if you write something like this, um, here's that. And oops, okay, let it be. So first, when you click uh, comment, it will send to IPFS. Then at this point, uh, we have IPFS seed, and we insert it here into a confirmation window. And then if you click sign and submit, uh, that's the seed goes to substrate uh, after you sign your transaction. And let's see. Okay, we have five comments. Some number increased, and it should be the last comment over here. And maybe we like this comment. Maybe. Yeah, Alice is the kind of person who would like her own comment. <laughs> <laughs> Hit her. Yeah, cool. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a great demo, and um, it actually is a pretty good segue into our, our next topic here, which is um, improvements to seminar and specifically some some ways to um, like choose topics or upvote and downvote on on topics. So, we'll, I guess maybe before I dive into that. Big thanks, Alex. That was a, a really nice seminar. I feel like I learned a lot. Yeah, my pleasure. So the, the second topic, I guess we have like 20 minutes, which probably is a perfect amount of time to talk about the, the seminar format. And so basically, um, I mean, so as with anything on seminar, like feel free to come off a of mute, share your ideas, share suggestions, any, anything like that. Um, and then I guess especially Ivana and CA from Parity's events team. Oh, hi CA, I see your camera and everything now too, cool. Um, I guess we wanna just have sort of like an open discussion about people's ideas and we, we have some ideas to, to share as well about like what platform to use, how to choose topics, how to get attendance up and, and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so I guess maybe just to seed the conversation, I'll share an idea that, um, that we've talked about a little bit internally and that idea is to move away from Zoom and toward Crowdcast. Um, and I think it, it has some costs and benefits, but the more I've thought about it, the more I think the benefits outweigh the costs, but that's just my own ideas. So I wanna also get everyone's ideas. Um, so yeah, I guess um, some of the benefits of Crowdcast are that we have like this nice scheduling system. It gives reminders to everybody. So you don't like forget when seminar is, um, it solves the problem of like, I haven't been very good with the uh, getting Google Calendar to show the right time zone for everybody and just like sort of mundane stuff like that, that in the end makes kind of a big, a big difference. And then I think the one big cost of switching to Crowdcast is that it sort of rules out the pos uh, not totally rules out, but it, it adds a little friction to the possibility of like, um, you know, today Steve had a question and unmuted his mic and just spoke up and in Crowdcast, it would be more of like the host relaying those questions. So maybe I'll just stop talking and like let everybody else share their their thoughts on on that first one. Like, what do you guys think about moving to Crowdcast? I think you bring up a really good point about the friction that it introduces, like specifically with Steve's question. That's a super valid, valuable, like direct insight. Um, uh, similarly, along those lines, I think that friction also addresses uh, like some of the issues I saw in chat where like sometimes people may forget to, to mute their mic and then that can be maybe even the participant finds that undesirable. Um, so, you know, sometimes friction can be a good thing. Uh, so that's one one kind of way of looking at that. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I think it's also worth noting that on Crowdcast, like you don't you don't eliminate the full possibility of being able to talk. Like so whoever's hosting the event and presenting is actually able to invite anybody who joins the event on screen to like ask a question if they want to go into a bit more detail. So there is that option as well, but it's like invite only you and you kinda need to like say you wanna say something so the, the host can invite you on. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So I, I think like my my instinct is I think we should try it. Um, it kind of just give everybody a chance to say like, no, please don't. I have a great reason. And then otherwise, I'm thinking like we should try it for a, at least a few weeks. Is what does everybody think? Yeah. So I wondered, CA or Ivana, do you guys want to like? You have a pretty good network of people that we would be able to reach by switching to Crowdcast, right? Like that's another advantage. 
Yeah, like if we go onto Crowdcast, there's already an existing community there of like around 400 people who follow the Crowdcast. So we would be using Polkadot's Crowdcast, actually. Um, and then we would also put like maybe a bit extra promotional effort behind it by just like having it in like our meetup groups and stuff like that and just tapping into like those audiences and just trying to get a bit more people who are being like want to engage uh, with Substrate in this way. Uh, yeah. Yeah, cool. I know in the last like two to three weeks, you guys have been helping me promote the the seminar more and it's paid off already. Like um, we have 16 people here today. I guess two of them are, are you guys. So, um, But that's still up a little bit. And like I know uh, Richard and Spencer, you guys are both new and Joran, you're not new, but like newish. You think you've been here for three or four weeks or something. Do you guys want to just share how you heard about seminar? That would probably be helpful. Um, how did I learn about seminar? I feel like I've just been like frantically trying to, to, to dig into like Polkadot and Kusama as much as possible. And somewhere in those travels, I like stumbled upon it and, and then tuned into the first one and I've been here ever since. Um, so it was just like something down the rabbit hole I went and, and, and it appeared to me. <laughs> <laughs> you went on a vision quest and yeah. substrate seminar appeared <laughs> yeah yeah that's cool yeah richard says in the chat i think i just found a link randomly in a chat and clicked it yeah so like that's kind of how we've been getting people so far and it's pretty clear that like with your guys's help and a more organized approach we could really do a lot better than that so yeah, um, I mean, we, we will definitely work more in promoting the seminar itself um, when it comes to the platform we were concerned about things like to people misinformation because you know when you add um, topics um, into the Google Calendar, does it remind them? Um, you know, does the reminders work because people just forget? You know, what was that week? They just start working and they forget. Oh, it's Tuesday and so on. So we wanted to find maybe a better platform that has that option where people are. Um, readily aware of all of the topics that are coming up. They can sign up for them. It gives them a really good way of getting reminded for it. Um, but, you know, as mentioned, Crowd has its, its pluses and minuses. One of the minuses being, and it's not that relaxed. I mean, it's not this kind of a format where it's more chatty and, you know, you see the photos of everybody and people are, can readily just, you know, start a discussion. Um, it's more being talked to than just participating as, as an overall discussion on topics. So it has its own disadvantages. That's unfortunately, if we can find something that brings these two to, things together, that would be perfect. I mean, yeah. Is this because, possible? Yeah. Because Is I guess, possible? yeah, sorry. <laughs> Alex, sorry. <laughs> Is it possible to combine uh, uh, Zoom and um, Crowdcast? I mean, to do this simultaneously? Have you tried? It's possible to stream into Crowdcast. Yes, it is. It's possible. But we've tried it before. And because it goes through a system called OBS, and it, it can happen that um, just the quality of, of stream is not that good. So when you have like uh, situations where you're presenting a code or something, the people that are looking at it through Crowdcast might have a problem seeing it that well. So, you know, it's not, it didn't work that well for us. And there's always a lag, you know, like you're talking and there's a lag and people start asking questions and it just creates confusion, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, adding half a second of latency can really cause a lot of like deeply ingrained human factors to break down the communication. No, it's even worse. It's even worse. It's like there is a lag, so it can yeah. create problems. So I wouldn't go into that, like not that direction, um, but you know, question is you know from the start whether or not you know the these reminders if 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 you know this is something that the community misses when it comes to uh, coming to these seminars if so then you know we have to figure out a way that we have a system in place that you know sends the reminders and people are know you know are reminded of the topic when it comes up and also that you know like in two days or in one day you know seminars is coming up i think another good question to kind of go back to is like what what is the vision for seminar and I really think that that that's not a question for anyone with the parody icon next to their name to answer like that's a question for the attendees to answer so you know what that's one thing to keep in mind like we're having this feedback session not so that we can all talk to each other in front of y'all but literally so we can gather your feedback so please feel free to share that and, and one thing that comes to mind is um 
you know, if we want uh, a more collaborative place where people can really kind of talk and potentially talk over each other, as we just saw with Ivana and Alex, that's something that tends to happen on Zoom. And Zoom is really a platform that I would say is op it's optimized for meetings. It's not optimized for events, you know, you don't invite 50 people to a meeting. If there's 50 people there, it's an event. And Crowdcast is kind of optimized for events and Zoom is kind of optimized for meetings. So which, which direction are we headed in? Is there maybe room for both? I, I don't know the answers to these questions. And Ivana, you and I have been involved in this user research interview, you know, and this kind of I'm not an expert in that, but I'm looking at the questions that we're asking in those user research interviews. And one of them is, how would you explain this thing to someone else? And implicit in that is maybe what do you like about it and what don't you like about it? And so as we're requesting feedback from people, that would be a great way for me to ask is like, how would you explain seminar to people? And, and in doing so, what do you like about it and what don't you like about it? Yeah. I agree. Yeah, it's one that's a, a good, a great point, Dan. And one of the things that we did a lot early on in seminar, and we do still do sometimes, but but less often is this idea of office hours where it's not prepared, where, you know, like today, Alex took some time to prepare a presentation for us. And last week, Renzi did it. And a couple of times I've done it, et cetera. And those are those are great. Um, but there, there was also this co uh, um, concept of like office hours where we just come, we show up, anyone can ask a question. And I love that idea because it's, it's like a more high throughput version of substrate technical chat where, so I think, you know, if you've been developing, not just on substrate, but at all, like you've been in that point where you're like, why doesn't my effing code compile? <laughs> like I just wanted, and office hours is, is something great for that. The, the drawback and the thing that sort of led me to having more prepared presentations is that sometimes there's these like weird silences where we're just sitting there and no one has a has a question yet um, but i i know some of the web3 people today were just recommending like hey we've got a lot of people asking for an office hours kind of format um so one idea that i just want to share is to do something where like we we break the seminar into two parts we do it on crowdcast and the first part is like a more of a presentation or something like what we did today and then the second part is office hours and the way it would work is anyone who has a sort of like good office hours style question can just post in the, the troll box or that little questions box that Crowdcast has and say like, hey, I'd like to get some office hours time. And so then after the presentation's done, then just one at, at a time, we invite those, those people on and sort of give them some office hours time that way. So I, I would be fine with doing that. Um, we just got to make sure we, what we don't want is for people to show up expecting to see something like what Alex did today. And they show up during the office hours part where we're just kind of talking about whatever came up. That could work. And to me, it sounds uh, very, very cool. But for, for this, I guess we need uh, one hour and 30 minutes because it could take some time. What was yeah. that last part? A part of what I really like about seminar is that, um, like, as a technical person, I get to I get access to you guys being close to the team and and close to what is coming out of this space. So I feel like it's like like I, I get to tap into like the en direct energy source, sort of so to speak, and and have like direct questions answered and stuff like that. Um, but I do understand how like that doesn't quite scale. Um, so I just wanted to highlight, like, I, I really value that piece. And as long as that exists in some way, shape or form, I think I'm, I'm happy, whatever, whatever decisions you guys make. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jordan. Cool. Um, and I, so, okay, so that's all really valuable. And then I guess like the, the last thing that we'll just bring up here is the, um, the question of like, how do we choose the topics? So what we've done so far, which is definitely not ideal, is that anyone who wants to present can volunteer to present. That part's I, I love, That's that part's ideal. Um, and then from there, I basically just have a calendar and I'm like, okay, so like, you know, at some point a few weeks ago, Alex said, hey, I, our roles and permissions palettes are pretty cool. We just refactored them, can I present it? And I was like, sure, you know, June 16th is open. How about you do it then? Um, but the problem is it sort of puts me like in control of the calendar, which I, 
isn't great because, you know, I'm at some point I might have different ideas than anyone else does. And there's also the possibility of just like, you know, I'm unable to attend or work on it for a while. So um, Ivano had made a suggestion that I, I liked about upvoting and downvoting. And then it, you know, I was reminded of it today, obviously, when Alex was showing us that those features are built into subsocial. Um, so I, I just wanted to sort of like brainstorm on how we could do that. Like, I, I love the idea of collecting suggestions somehow and then having people upvote the suggestions that they like and then have those topics come up. Some weaknesses I, I can foresee are like, you know, uh, maybe Addie says, hey, I've got a topic that I'd like to present and then we upvote it for a week when she can't come or something like that. You know, there's little practical concerns, but I sort of suspect we could work around that. Anybody want to propose a platform or have thoughts to share about that idea? So I, uh, I'm in a Toastmasters group and we run into this a little bit and it really just comes down to one person being assigned how to manage that. And there's not necessarily a, a slick way to do it. But um, yeah, it's it's just going to be kind of like man hours. And uh, I'm kind of dreading it because I'll be the next one for the next six months. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's what I can offer. Yeah, thanks, Spencer. So so in that group, you're, you'll basically be like elected or rotated or whatever to be the person who does the scheduling for the next six months. And then it'll be. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. So you yeah. might I mean, you could split it out and have multiple people. Um, you know, handle different roles if it's if it's too much for one person. But as long as those people rotate, um, then then you can get more insight. And every six months, you can have maybe a slightly different different uh, method of doing this until you find one that that really sticks. Yeah, nice. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, um, I like it as well. So I wanted to just bring up one more kind of idea that I had, and I, I don't know if this is a good idea or not. It seemed very blockchain-y and that made me like it, but I know sometimes getting too blockchain-y isn't always the right idea. I, I had this idea of doing like uh, token voting on, on topics and the idea is like, you can upvote a topic uh, if you want it to be presented. And when you do that, you like lock some, some tokens to upvote it. And then if you attend the seminar you voted for, you get those tokens back. But if you upvote it and then ghost, then you like, you know, don't don't get your tokens back or something. So I was curious if anybody likes ideas, not even that specific one, but like ideas like that where we start using like blockchain style incentivization mechanisms or if it's better to keep it a little more off chain and, and squishy. I like this idea and I described to you my vision on this. I, I don't know, have you noticed it or not? Um, in the seminar, Riot Channel? Mm -hmm. um, Maybe miss it. I, mean, I just, might have it. Yeah, I, I can just repeat uh, shortly. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, please I, I already explained to you um, that uh, our post is quite flexible structure. And uh, right now it has three types, uh, like regular post. You can think of it like a status on Twitter or article medium. It doesn't matter because of, uh, of chain. And second is shared post. And third one is a comment or reply. So um, we put this flexibility um, specifically to address uh, future variations of posts like um, events uh, like on meetup or on job positions like on LinkedIn or polls like you can have on Twitter. And one of the upcoming things that we would like to implement is polls. And uh, I already saw this request on um, Kusama direction maybe a couple of months ago where people discussed something like so there is possibility to create a proposal, but you need to stake uh, how much? Five or 10% of a uh, required amount. And maybe you will lose this amount, but uh, you don't want to try your luck. So it would be cool to create sort of a poll and maybe on chain so people can uh, vote uh, either they, uh, they will support it or not. So to see some likelihood about uh, whether it's going to uh, win on proposal or not. And then after poll ended, uh, you have more data of, of, about uh, opinion from the council members, right? So I already see um, requirements for this and we're going to work on this after this current release. 
So my proposal was, if you're interested in this, maybe I can assist you and we can create extension to the post. Uh, we can create this poll and then uh, our goal is also to launch uh, alternative to public assembly. So we can discuss proposals uh, on subsocial and we can uh, send tips to people and maybe some upcoming bounty um, discussions I saw. I would like to add support for all this stuff like uh, monetization. It's, it's it sounds very interesting to bring monetization to social networking and uh, blockchain is uh, amazing thing for this, right? So we have built-in monetization feature, um, not features, but uh, possibilities and why not to use it? Yeah, that's cool. So you're saying we could actually like integrate something like this onto subsocial. Yes, and another thing, I mean, to add uh, on top of this is uh, we're also thinking about uh, creating uh, tokens per community, per space, and uh, this also aligns with your ideas uh, to have the space, um, to have the tokens. And for example, you're creating a poll and you say that uh, to participate in this poll, you need to vote with your tokens of this space, exact space, and maybe you want to set up some flexibility if one uh, token is one vote or maybe one account is one vote and then you specify all the options uh, and then options store in chain, descriptions on off chain, everything is cool as you like. <laughs> and yeah, why not? Yeah, yeah, cool. So, so my so suggestion is to, to, to start with something web point, web 2.0 and uh, if you're interested, uh, um, I, I will help you. I will help you with all these polls. Um, I wanted to comment actually that um, I think there needs to be the least amount of friction for this because like if you make it really complicated people will not be participating in it that much um, so it needs to be yeah I understand the gamification part of it that it's blockchain based as well but we shouldn't make it difficult you know when I was reading today the description of it, I was like oh <laughs> how people will need to read and reread the description in order to understand, you know, and it's every week as well. So I am thinking maybe using this for some, some activities or some certain things, but not maybe regularly every week or something, but, you know, like we can think of some projects we can use it for or some events in general, like sub zero voting for, for, for maybe some topics and so on. But um, I wouldn't use it for like every single week for, for voting on, on, on things. I think it's very complicating. Can I answer to this? <laughs> because I consider myself as a UX advocate for blockchains and for dApps. And uh, you're totally right. And uh, I also, maybe every day, I'm trying to keep all this in mind that nobody will use what we're doing if uh, we have here and there confirmation windows and everything and compl complex logic. And maybe if you notice it, we already tried to put some UX into what we're doing and uh, we, we're going to improve it much more. So how I see it, we could start with some simple web 2.0 solutions and uh, people will get to use it and we see how they use it. And meanwhile, uh, such as Josh is interested and we are super interested, we can work on this. And uh, once we have this uh, UX uh, smooth, and everybody can use it. I don't see a reason not to use it because uh, who, if not us, should use our own dog food, right? And uh, drink champagne, as Dan Forbes likes to say. <laughs> I remember this <laughs> phrase. <laughs> yeah, so unless there is no uh, cool, cool uh, UX, uh, I think we not, should not force people to use it. But uh, this is why we got here, right? And this is a vision of Web3 Foundation and everything. We need to create a, a cool and strong uh, solid alternatives to centralized services. And uh, this also includes uh, sh that we should have a uh, smooth UX that is not worse than anything else. And we have some cool, cool ideas and this like session keys and uh, client uh, state for the app. Yeah. So how, what do we think? About, I, I don't think we're going to come to any like final decision. Here's how seminar will play out for the next six months like today. But I think it's awesome that we all shared our ideas. Um, I think probably we'll be on Crowdcast starting next week, at least for a while, unless we you know, try it a few times and turns out we don't like it or whatever. Um, 
so I think the most important thing at this point is for everyone to know how, how to know where we're going to be, like, since we'll try some new formats. So I wanted to just share in the, I've shared in the chat already this, um, this uh, riot room that substrates the substrate seminar riot room. And then I'll also share this link that you might've seen before uh, substrate.dev slash seminar. So if for whatever reason, you know, next week rolls around and you're like, oh man, I forget what they said, where, where's the seminar going to be? And you come to Zoom here and nobody's here. Um, those are two places that, that you can check and then we'll, you know, be increasingly clear and communicative moving forward. And I really think that uh, the events team and, and Crowdcast will, will help with those things. So and also um, just as like an additional point, Joshi, if anyone maybe, you know, felt uncomfortable sharing insights on a on seminar today or whatever we're always in zoom i'm always thinking about oh, sorry you're not zoom uh thank 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 the lord i'm not always in zoom sorry that's my own <laughs> personal thought about zoom um but uh i'm always in riot um and so if you have any thoughts that you would like to share any insights you just want to kind of chat about it and maybe you don't feel like you have super well-formed uh thoughts but you still just want to talk about what seminar is or what you think it should be or any of the stuff that we do um please reach out to us and riot at any time and you know we'd love to, to hear what you think and talk about this and um you'd be surprised maybe one day you'll see one of your suggestions uh materialize into reality yeah totally that's that's exactly right and then i guess also just to get a little more concrete if you do have a topic that you'd like to share or even you know before we've decided concretely like how we're going to choose them and everything like share it in the seminar room or yeah like dan said dm it to me or to him or to any any anyone um and uh then we'll we'll get it scheduled hopefully with some some upvoting um so yeah, I think we'll probably wrap here just because we're, we're over time. I really appreciate everyone sharing their ideas and everything. Um, and then just one more time, like Spencer and Richard and Yao, Addy, thanks a lot guys for coming today. It was nice to see you at seminar and hope to see you back next week or in the future. Okay, bye everybody. And thanks a lot, Alex, especially. Thank you, see you. Okay, bye, bye. Bye.